Welcome everyone to the webinar, Advocacy with Youth, Examining the Empowerment Model and Ageism to Serve Youth Better. Uh, again, my name is Sandy Green and I'm the organizer for today's webinar. Um, today's webinar will be a great chance to learn about working with young people who have been sexually assaulted. Um, we'll also have some conversations about how, um, how you can use the expertise that they already have to um, your benefit when working with young people. We'll identify barriers um, that may stand in the way of serving youth in a relevant and empowering way. Um, in this webinar, you will get an overview of what makes an organization youth-friendly and youth-competent. We will discuss how to prepare staff and volunteers to uh, work with youth in person and on the helpline. Um, the Washington Coalition of Sexual Assault Programs is a nonprofit organization that strives to unite agencies engaged in the elimination of sexual violence. WICSAP provides information, training, and expertise to program and individual members who support victims, family, and friends, the general public, and all those whose lives have been affected by sexual assault. Um, we do have our annual conference coming up uh, May 3rd through the 5th, and that's going to be in Vancouver, Washington this year. Um, and the theme for this year is Grounded for Growth. Uh, before we get started, I want to go over some logistical information um, about the webinar. So throughout the presentation, your lines will be muted. Um, however, there is a chat box at the bottom left of your screen that you can um, ask questions or if you need any type of technical assistance, and we will be responding to those uh, as they come up. Um, the materials from this presentation will be recorded, archived, and posted on the WICSAP website approximately one week after the webinar. So you will be able to um, get the, the PowerPoint um, and the audio portion of this at a later date. Um, if you are sharing a computer with your colleagues, um, be sure and email uh, to Sandy, S-A-N-D-Y, at wixap.org, uh, a list of all the names of the participants so that you can get your um, training hours. Um, again, this, uh, this webinar will count as one and a half hours of ongoing training credits, and you will receive a follow-up email from us for your records. Um, and again, um, at the end, please take a few moments and fill out the evaluation. We do um, use those in uh, planning our future events, and we uh, really appreciate your time and your feedback. So at the end, you will be uh, emailed an evaluation. Please take a few moments and send that back to us. Um, for now, I will introduce Erin, and she is going to tell you a little bit about herself, and we will get this started. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Sandy. I'm grabbing the phone from Sandy over here. Um, I hope everyone can hear me all right. Let me know if you can't in that chat box. I see that many of you are already using it, so that's great. If you haven't noticed yet, there is that, um, that chat box down there, and I, I think Sandy said, you know, we're going to – I would love to take questions throughout this webinar. Um, the more interaction I can get from you all, the better for me. Um, I really – love doing trainings and hate not being able to see your faces. Um, that makes me feel so much better when I get a little bit of feedback or a question or um, anything really from you. So I will ask for a little participation um, throughout, but otherwise please chime in and I will try to address anything that I see. And at the end there will probably be a few minutes to answer some questions as well. It just depends on how quickly I speed through all of this material and how much interaction I get from you in the meantime. Okay, so Sandy talked about the objectives, so I'm not going to go over those a ton again. Um, but I will say this. Let me just get my notes in order here. Um, we're going to talk about all the things Sandy mentioned, but we're also going to try to address how to ensure that young people are receiving the best services possible when they come into contact with your agency. I know that a lot of you do not work with youth um, solely, like that is not your main objective in your work. You're working with survivors in general, probably, and of all ages and all backgrounds. And um, this webinar is really to try and pinpoint how you can serve youth when they come through your doors, because they will. Um, if they're not, there's a bigger issue maybe going on, because youth are definitely experiencing sexual assault and are being referred to services throughout the state of Washington. And I'm talking specifically from a Washington perspective because that's what I know. Um, but probably wherever you are, that's true. <laughs> so um, if you're not seeing them, 
this is not a marketing webinar, so I'm not, I'm not going to teach you how to get them into your agency right now. We're going to talk about when they do call, when they do show up, um, how do you address their various needs, how do you make sure they feel like you, you know how to work best with them. So that's where I'm coming from. Um, okay. All right. So a little bit about who I am before I, I get started. I've worked with youth since before I became an adult, that's what this slide says, um, and that's definitely true for me. I was a sexual assault advocate and preventionist at Oasis Youth Center before um, working with WICSAP. I worked with WICSAP as a training specialist the last couple of years. I am currently on break from the sexual assault field, and um, there's good things and bad things about that. I feel a little bit rusty um, talking to all of you, and I feel really excited to talk to you from a place where I feel rested from the work, and I'm a little bit, a little bit removed, so I can think about what were the challenges for me when I was doing the work, what really did work for me. Um, I'm not in the crisis mode right now, so that's kind of nice for my brain, and I hope that that makes it um, helpful for you to hear from me. Um, at Oasis Youth Center, that's a place in Pierce County that serves um, lesbian, bisexual, trans, gay youth um, ages 14 to 24. So we had a, a wide range of people coming in our doors. Um, I also worked as the volunteer coordinator at Oasis Youth Center, and that is something that I'm going to draw on a lot throughout this webinar because volunteers, I think, are such an essential key um, to keeping our agencies consistent and friendly and competent and all of those things. If, if your people on your hotline don't know how to work with a population that's calling in, then that appears like your agency doesn't know how to. And that can be really challenging because we need volunteers and we need them um, at weird hours and weird times. And we want to take anyone who comes through our doors willing to volunteer a lot of the time. So I'm going to talk a little bit about quality volunteership and how to how to grow that in your agency. Um, I worked as a mentor in a middle school in Los Angeles, and I'm going to tell some stories about myself throughout this webinar because they're relevant to my work. <laughs> so you'll learn more about that. I worked as, um, as a mentor for underprivileged youth. I was often the only person with those young people for like half of the day, uh, and it taught me a lot about what people need and kind of how caught up we can get in our own stuff when we're working with young people. Okay, so why youth? Um, like I said, mostly because I was one. Um, the good news is we all were. So there's a lot that we can all draw on, we can relate to when we're working with youth. Um, I think that can be a help and a hindrance, so I'm going to talk about that later on too. Um, sometimes that we have experienced ageism, we all have. It's the only form of oppression that we all can relate to, which I think is an interesting thing. We can't say, you know, back when I was African American, you know, if I was never African American, I never was, and that's not anything I'm ever gonna ever relate to. But with ageism, I can say when I was 12, when I was 13, when I was 15, when I was 16, and so can you. And that I think we can use for the better, but it can often be turned into something that we use for the worse. So we're gonna talk about that as just like, how do we deal with our own um, internalized ageism of what, who we were when we were young um, and turn that into our strengths and how do we make that something that young people can really thrive with because we know ourselves well enough to do that. Um, the other thing is youth really need your services. They really need your services. 80% um, of Washington women's sexual assault experiences occurred prior to the age of 18. 80% of women rape victims were victimized before age 25, and 42% were victimized before the age of 18. And one in four male rape victims were victimized before the age of 10. So if you're not seeing young people, um, there's a huge gap in your services. If you are seeing young people, but you're not spending the time to focus on how to best serve them, there's a huge gap in your services. Um, so this is all just stuff to keep in mind. Okay. so. Let's start. Um, first, I want to look at our strengths. Uh, the good news is good advocacy is good advocacy. Whatever you're doing now that's working, it works for young people too. <laughs> and so that is awesome. Um, you already have this. Being a good advocate for youth is very similar to being a good advocate for anyone else. 
Um, I want to break down a little bit. I know you all probably know this information, but I would love for you to respond in the chat box, if you could, with what an advocate's role is. And I'm going to give you a few seconds to do that. So just give me some examples. It could be um, really anything. It could be a safe place. It could be all these other things. Okay, so I see to empower, to listen, to validate feelings, absolutely, to support and empower. What else? Coming alongside someone, yeah, so walking with someone. Provide empowering resources. Listen, support, and give resources. Provide understanding and support to help with resources. To help, or sorry, to do what is being asked of you. To safety plan. A liaison for the victim and support. To meet them where they are at safety planning, support, and provide information and resources, and, um, yep, help with problem solving and find options, empathy, support, listen, hold hands, provide help and empathy, ascertain what survivor really wants, validate someone have a venue, help someone to have a venue to speak up and receive support they need and survivor-centered solutions. So these are all great. Non-judgmental support just came in. Okay, perfect. These things are exactly what I'm looking for. Um, respect the healing continuum, awesome. Okay, so write in now, if you could, just what a, an advocate's role is not. Because <laughs> these are all really good answers. I don't even have to add to them. Okay, value, judgment, they're not a friend. They're not to give orders. Absolutely. Um, they're not controlling, demanding, or judgmental. They're not a therapist. They're not presenting only the options they think the survivor should choose. Yep. That's a dangerous ground. <laughs> um, they're not a judger, a teacher, a preacher, or a blamer. I like that. I'm going to snap at you for that. Um, they're not a Rolodex of services. I'd love to know more about what that means because I've never heard that before. Um, they don't discredit the experience or minimize. They're not giving advice from their own experience. Yeah, okay, so these are all great. And I think they're all the same things I have written down. The only one I have on here that is different is they're not a parent. Um, they're not a mom. They're not a dad to the survivor. They're not a doctor. Um, but otherwise, we're on the same page in general. So all of that, see, this is what you guys already know. You already have this. You know how to be good advocates. You know how to support someone um, in the empowerment model. But there are some things that make it harder with young people um, than everyone else. So what you see out on your screen, I say mandatory reporting and assigned a real helplessness. So we're going to talk a little bit more about mandatory reporting, but the gist is that the system is not set up for us to let youth be autonomous completely, right? And there's really good things about that, and then there's really harmful things sometimes about that too. Um, the system is set up to try and keep young people safe no matter what, and they're the only survivors that will come to you, and you might have to do something that they ask you not to do. So if a survivor who's over 18 years old comes in your office and they talk about their experience, they don't have to filter their experience at all um, with you in order to not have a consequence that they don't want. They don't have to worry about you calling the cops on them. They don't have to worry about you, um, you know, taking them to court. They don't have to worry about them getting kicked out of their home. They don't have to worry about that stuff. And you can really be a neutral observer of a situation and say, well, what would you like to have happen with this? We can work on safety planning. You know, we can do all of those things without you saying, I'm sorry, you don't have a choice about this. I have to make this call. Um, obviously, the reason for the call is, is good, it's good-natured, it's good-hearted that we want a young person to be safe and, and they aren't able to make the legal decision at that point about what that means, um, but that can take away from, from what the empowerment model is trying to support, you know, that we can't be completely neutral. Um, and then the assigned or real helplessness is what, I, what I've observed over the years working with young people is that when someone is young, because the system is set up for us to kind of make decisions for them and think about what is best for them, 
we can, t we can decide they're not able to do that for themselves. It's really easy to go into that place of like, well, you don't know what's best for you. You don't know, you know, that there are all these options that you should have. Or when you say you want to stay home and be with your parents even though this abusive thing is happening, you don't actually know that that's true for you. And so we can assign the helplessness to them, or there can be real helplessness happening where someone's completely powerless over their circumstances. Um, they are asking for help, and they don't know what to do. And that can be really complicated when we're advocates trying to support their empowerment and just trying to give them, you know, all the choices and respect their decisions and all of that. But when we get caught up in that assigned a real helplessness, it's really hard for us to stay neutral. I hope that makes sense. Um, and I noticed that somebody wrote in the sidebar because I said I wanted to know what a Rolodex of services was. Um, they answered me. So they said, what I mean is that we don't just listen to the client's story and spit out a menu of options or services or phone numbers. We work with the client to explore options and empower their choices. Yeah, that's great. I will use that in the future. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit more about empowerment. Um, it's not just for adults anymore. <laughs> um, Young people need to feel heard and respected. So all the things that you all just told me about what empowerment is and what advocacy is, that's true for young people. Um, you may be the only person in, in that young person's life that can provide that. Um, something about me, so I'm going to just use some examples about my life as we go through this because I'm, a, I'm an example of a young person at one time. Um, I had respectful adults that were not in my family of origin when I sought services that really made me think I was in control of my life. And I didn't know I had that at the time, but that was the difference for me between um, thriving in my life and surviving in my life. And, and there was a critical mass point for me with that, where I would go, I, I sought services in lots of different ways because I needed them, um, and my family was not the place for that. And I would say, you know, I need help, and people would say, well, what do you want? What do you want to do with that? You know, if you're not showing up for school for months at a time, what are you going to do about it? Nobody can show up for you. And nobody pushed their agenda, or that's a lie. Lots of people pushed their agenda, but some people didn't push their agenda on me. And those people made me really realize that it's like, oh, okay, if I want something different in my life, I have to do something different. And that is something when I'm an advocate for a young person I have to be really careful with. And, again, I think it's really hard because we want to keep you safe. Um, not autonomous. You know, like we're kind of like at all costs, I just want to get this person to stay alive through the age of 18, no matter what. <laughs> and if we keep them alive till they're 18, we've done our job. Um, and to some extent, that's true. And to another extent, you know, it, it teaches the young person that they don't, that they are not the person that can help themselves, that they're not the person that gets to have autonomous choices. Um, you know, all of those things. So, one way that we can set, set survivors up if they walk into our agency or they call um, is through our intake process. And we're going to talk a little bit more in depth about intakes and some examples of intakes and how to, or examples of things on intakes um, and how to kind of walk through that with people. But this is sort of, this is the first, the first experience a young person is going to have with you um, when they walk in your door. And so when I think of intakes, I think of in-person. And when I think of um, the next bullet point, I'm going to talk about hotlines a little bit. But intakes is that in-person um, experience with you. So I'm assuming a lot of the time that if somebody's walking into your office to do an intake, they have already disclosed sexual assault and there has already been a mandatory report. That's not true always. Um, they could be a secondary victim or they could be um, seeking services, but they haven't yet disclosed that there's been a sexual assault, and so they, they are being veiled about what has happened and why they're accessing services. Um, but this is the point where we can be super honest with them about who we are, what we do, what we're good at, and what our obligations are. Um, and that, that is a critical point because young people, the more information they have, just like any survivor, the more information they have, the better choices they can make. And the more that we respect um, what they want to have happen and not push them, um, which is in that inve investigating kind of bullet point, <laughs> um, the better advocates we can be for them. And the more they know that you're youth-friendly, really. So if I walk in as a 16-year-old and I'm being really veiled about my experience, 
for example. You know, I could come in and just say, something bad has happened. I am not feeling safe. I don't feel good. Um, and us, as advocates, we could say, I need more information because I need to make a report, right? There's a different attitude with that of saying, tell me more about that. Where do you live? What's your last name? You know, all of these things that make us able to make a report. And we might be doing that investigating because we're scared for that young person and we want to help them. Uh, we want to save them, you know, we want to fix them. Um, and our motives might be really good, but that doesn't feel empowering. It feels like everyone else in that young person's life who's trying to figure it out for them, um, make a call for them, you know, all of those things. But if we're able to kind of have a, I call it my poker face a lot of the time when young people come to me because it's like, I am freaking out inside. I want to make the right choice. I want to help them. It's scary, you know, when somebody comes to you and you're like, I don't think they're safe and I know they're going home and I can't actually, I don't have enough information to make a report. Um, it's not my business right now to make a report. Maybe I don't even know that they're under 18, you know, all of those things. Um, it's scary, but the more chill I am with them and say, oh, okay, so you don't feel safe. Um, okay, do you want to tell me more about that? First, let me tell you about us and what we do and what we're able to do with you um, and let you know about our policies, have you sign these policies so you understand them um, and go over them with you in that intake process. The more that they're going to go, oh, okay, she's not freaking out. You know, I told her that I, all these things, but I tell other adults and they freak out and they try and, they try and stop me from going home or they try and keep me from doing the thing I want to do. I'm not going to do that as an advocate, even if I want to. You know, and I think that's the thing. It's like sometimes we're going to want to, um, but but the poker face is really important and the honesty. You know, they can see through you also, you, you know, but if you can say, okay, I'm feeling concerned because of the words you're using, but I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt and just, and just trust that you're going to tell me what you want me to know. You know, you can be honest with them uh, without, without kind of, um, you know, having that sort of, how do I put this? Sort of a neediness about it, of like, okay, um, where are you? Okay, what's going on? You know, what, what, what is your name? Where is your parent? All of that stuff where it comes from my panic center, um, they're going to be like, never mind, <laughs> got to go. You know, you're not the one for me. Um, this is their normal a lot of the time. If somebody's being ex experiencing abuse at a young age, um, this is maybe not a new experience for them. And when we get panicked and when we join their crisis, it, it drives them away from us. I hope that makes sense. So the not investigating on hotlines is another thing of like, how do you train for that? Um, how much information do you try to get out of a, out of a person on a hotline call? Um, can you let them be truly anonymous so that they can have the experience they want to have unless they want you to make a report for them or they want to tell you more information about themselves? Okay, so this last bullet is just talking about how can we get support um, when we see a young person struggling, because like I said, sometimes I'm using my best poker face, and that doesn't mean <laughs> that, uh, that I'm not freaking out internally or that I'm not having a, a pretty hard experience. Um, so that might be the time that I need to call my coworkers when I get off the phone or I need to check in with my supervisor and say, oh, my God, I don't know if I did the right thing. You know, I'm really having a hard time. Um, with this case, and I need everyone to know that we're on the same we're on the same page. That they would have done the same thing. You know, how do I follow up? Because we don't want to take a chance with a young person's life. That's not what we're trying to do. But we are trying to give them the best choices that we can as we support them. Oh, I missed my good slide here. Okay, to catch the squirrel, you must become the squirrel. So we're gonna talk about this a little bit. Um, I just want to stare at that dog's face for a second, and then I'll move on. Okay. So, this is about starting with you. And I was talking to Sandy before the webinar. I was like, I think I'm going to make people mad. Um, she doesn't think I'm going to make any of you mad because you all do your own good work with yourself. Um, but I know that when someone tells me I have to take a good long look at myself, <laughs> that is not a fun thing to hear, especially when you're working in crisis. You're busy. Uh, you have a lot going on. You're dealing with day-to-day -day crisis um, calls and experiences, and maybe you're just spending your evenings trying to recover from those. You know, so it's, it's not always easy to do deep investigative work of ourselves. Um, but I think for us to be good advocates to youth, we really have to um, 
remember what it was like to be one. And that doesn't, again, this is where I'm going to expand a little bit on how that doesn't always make us better at it. Sometimes when we remember what it's like to be one, um, we judge our youth self. <laughs> I don't know about you, but um, this is true for me the older I get. When I started the work when I was 22 or 23, um, I didn't judge my youth self the same amount as I do now. Um, Ten years later, I'd say, oh, you know, I was 12, I didn't know what I was doing, I didn't know what I wanted. Um, I'll give an example, an innocent example of this, right, that's not about survivorship, but youth survivors will come to you with all of this. Um, when I was 12, I believed with my whole heart I was in love, in love, capital I, capital L, um, through 12 and 13, same person, and you could not have told me otherwise. And, and if I'm honest with myself now, if I validate that 12-year-old, it was true, right? Um, but the older I get, the more I disqualify that experience. The more I say, I didn't know what being in love was. 12-year-olds can't be in love. They don't know what's going on. You know, and, and so I invalidate my little 12-year-old the older I get. I didn't do it when I was 18. I didn't do it when I was 22. I didn't do it when I was 27 because I was still relating to some of those experiences in me. And I relate to them less and less the older I get, right? I have a healthy long-term relationship. I was 12. I was also a little um, unstable, let's say. I was also, you know, um, I, was, I had a lot of coping mechanisms to survive when I was 12 and 13 uh, that didn't look great on the outside. Um, but those, those coping mechanisms got me through life and got me to where I did survive until I was old enough to deal with some hard stuff. So I, I don't want to discredit any of that, but that's the kind of work I have to do because when I see a 12-year-old that reminds me of me, when I haven't dealt with my stuff, they scare me. They terrify me. Um, and this is not probably a popular thing, but when I started working with youth, it's because they scared me. When I was 22 or 23, I went on a field trip with 12 and 13-year-olds, and I was like, I am terrified of these people. They literally terrify me. Um, and I was like, what is up with that? You know, what's wrong with me that I'm so scared of these young people that look perfectly innocent, they're totally nice. You know, the worst thing that happened on that field trip was like funny pranks. And I was like, I am terrified of you. And that is because I was terrified of me. Um, so I had to do work on that. And um, part of the work for me was I, I started being around young people more and started asking them about their lives and learning about what was going on for them and realizing that they're real people with real, real hopes and dreams, real feelings. Big things are happening for them. Um, and what was happening for me was valid and true and real and all of that. So anyway, I'm pushing you, I guess, to kind of look at the good and the bad of, of your childhood, which is not an easy thing to do. Um, that could be, you know, 30 years of therapy, so I'm not trying to say <laughs> that you have to do it all today. Um, but I think that if I, if I start validating my experience as a young person, um, it, it's a lot better for me when I meet with a, a young person that's struggling. Um, you also have to really believe 100% in their power to heal and in their resilience. Um, young people are extremely resilient. Uh, um, yeah, so they're extremely resilient. Sorry, I saw a question, so I wanted to look over there. But I'm going to pass that off to you, I think. Um, they're very, very resilient. They can heal 100%. They can have beautiful, thriving lives, even in the midst of extreme trauma as, as young people. So I want to just plug that. Um, what's hard for me as an advocate sometimes is to remember that in the middle of the crisis. I see all of these layers of oppression happening with young people um, where they're not being heard, where they're being shuffled from house to house, depending on um, if there's been a report or if they're getting kicked out or if they're going from their grandmas to their moms to their brother's house, trying to find a safe place to be. Um, if they're struggling with poverty, if they're experiencing multiple layers of abuse um, throughout their lives, and it feels like this person's never going to be okay. You know, it's hard for me to believe that that person can be okay, can grow through this experience, can see this experience as something that is contributing to their um, thriving in the future, you know. And so for me, it's something I have to remember about myself, that I've turned a lot of bad experiences into really good experiences for me, um, that I, you know, we all can do that. And young people have, have like, the best ability to do that. They are very bounce backable, and 
um, they need they need us to be that kind of guiding, constant, consistent force in their lives so that they can keep growing. Um, let's see here. I have some if-then clauses somewhere here. Let me see if I can find them. Oh, I know where they are. They're on that computer. Okay. So one thing that um, I really appreciate is if-then clauses. I don't have them written out for you all. Um, but if you join their crisis, <laughs> even if your heart is in the right place, um, then they do not get the support that they need and their resilience. If I deal with myself as a 12-year-old and heal from the things that happen to me, then I become a good advocate for that youth and they can have a really honest and loving experience. You know, if I'm full of ism and prejudice and fear of youth, you know, then that person gets shut down. So I like to just kind of think about, like, if I do the work, then I get the results. And that's true for them, too. Okay. So we're just going to real quick review what ageism is here. Okay. Does all of that make sense when I say start with you? And advocacy, is that too generic for y'all? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. I got, I got a yes, so I feel validated. Thank you. Um, it's really weird on a webinar to be talking into space and not, not know how it's going for you all. So I'm just going to keep yapping, and you just let me know if you have any questions um, or want me to reiterate anything. So ageism, again, um, it is, it's exactly what this slide says. It's stereotyping and discriminating against individuals or groups on the basis of their age. Um, and this can be casual or systematic. It can be, you know, it's definitely in the system for us not to trust young people about their experiences. Um, and it can also just be in each of our individual interactions with young people. Um, ageism is the belief that we as adults know better than the young person does about their own life. And it is the opposite of empowerment. And we can oscillate, I feel like, between wanting to save them and blaming them. So an example of that is um, if somebody walks into my office and they and I can kind of pet, put them on a pedestal that they're this young, they're young and they're a victim and um, nobody's there for them and I need to do something. And I feel an extreme need, you know, to give them money so that they can eat. Or I feel an extreme need to find them shelter even though there's nowhere good for them to stay. I feel an extreme need to uh, give them my personal phone number because I'm not going to be on the crisis line tomorrow and I need them to be able to get a hold of me. And as much as we all know, because you guys are great advocates and you've already written in um, about what a good advocate is, and I know you know that, it is hard <laughs> with a young person sometimes, extremely hard. Um, it's, it's just not as black and white as I wish it were. So I can oscillate, and I'll give, I guess I'll give a personal example of when I was working with youth as well in this, in this regard. Um, there was a 17-year-old, I think she was at that time, and I had been working with her on and off since she was 14, um, and she was getting kind of shuffled back and forth between her parents' house and her grandma's house. And her father, she called on the crisis line. She said that she didn't have anywhere to go, um, that she was talking to her, with her dad, and she thinks he's going to kick her out. And uh, we, we came up with a safety plan of how to get a hold of me, what to do next, where to go, et cetera. And then she never called back, and I had, a, I had a return phone number, and I called, and the dad had dropped her off in the middle of um, a big city, and she was a rural youth. She hadn't really spent any time there, but I think she thought, well, then I could get buses, right, so I could get to other places. Um, so I had no way to get a hold of her. She had no way to get a hold of me. I didn't have enough information for, the, for cops or, you know, to make a report to tell them where she was. I did make the call, but it didn't help. You know, I was like, somewhere in downtown Tacoma. There is a young person fitting this approximate description. I don't know their last name, and um, they are on the street at 10 at night without anyone, and they can't get a hold of me. And I was on, so I'm on the crisis line, and I was doing an errand because that's what I was doing that day. And I had a breakdown, you know, just that feeling of, like, I should just go to downtown Tacoma. I'll just start driving around. At least I know what they look like. I could find them. Um, <laughs> and I'm a decent advocate, you know, I would say, but I don't generally get caught up in crisis like that um, and start to feel like it's my job to save the world. But it felt really hard. You know, I knew this young person. I knew that, that she had um, various learning disabilities, had a lot of different 
things going on for her, was not used to the city, um, you know, all of those things, and it really scared me that I couldn't fix it, I couldn't save her, I couldn't make sure she was okay that night, and she did end up okay. And we did get back in touch, and we helped her get shelter and all of that. But that night, it was really hard for me, um, and that was my kind of oscillation in, into saving them. And then the other end of the spectrum is, I can really want to blame a young person, too, when they're on drugs, when their um, coping mechanism is cutting themselves, when, you know, they never go to school, when maybe their mom seems like a nice person and, you know, there are some decent resources for them and, and they're struggling because they're survivors and they've experienced trauma and they don't know how to live the way that society wants them to. Um, so it can go back and forth that, like, my trauma comes out in either kind of dismissing them, like, oh, well, they should be doing better, um, or wanting to save them and thinking that they're all innocent, you know, no, totally powerless, totally helpless, um, and kind of flip-flop back and forth. And I see that a lot with teenagers, you know, that there is that extreme where there's people who um, put them on pedestals and think that they are kind of next to God, you know, in the sense of, like, being very innocent and having no control over their circumstances and then going the opposite way of just, like, oh, they're just punk teenagers, you know, and, and they need to get it together, you know. <laughs> so both of those attitudes are ageism for me, you know, and that's, and that's how they present a lot of times, I think, in staff and volunteers and all kinds of things. Okay. Any questions so far? I'm going to give you a few seconds to ask. And I'll move on. Great. Okay. Perfect. Um, all right. I'm going to keep moving. Let me know if you have any questions. So we're going to talk about volunteer screening, and this is the more practical application of some of the stuff that we're talking about. Um, and I just can't emphasize enough when I say quality over quantity with volunteers. And that is a really hard thing, I think, to stick to for us because we, we literally need more manpower. You know, we, we need people on the phones when we're not available. We want to give our staff a break. Um, you know, we want to take any good-hearted person that walks in the door and says, I want to volunteer for your hotline. You know, I want to volunteer for your program. Of course we want to say, yes, please, you know, please help us. Um, come on in. And if they're not terrible people, we feel like that sometimes is good enough. Um, unfortunately, I do not think that that is good enough for volunteers. And this is with all survivors, right? We're talking about young people, but all of this is across the board true for all survivors. Um, hold on. We have a question. I want to read it real quick. Have you found any type of problems around cultural values when it comes to ageism? I am Native American, and we want to believe that our elder knows best. Yes, actually, I have. So um, the question is, have I seen different cultural values play into ageism? Um, and this person is using Native Americans as a specific example, saying that elders know best. I've definitely seen that in multiple um, cultures, not just Native. I, I worked with a lot of Samoan youth, which was kind of random, but that would come in to the center and um, had similar values of like, just absolutely young people don't have a voice. Um, I don't know what I'm, I don't know who I am. I don't know what I'm talking about and I'm not allowed to really speak my mind. Um, I've, I've definitely seen that and I would say that the only thing that we can do as advocates is to just be that other voice. You know, that it's, you can validate that respect for elders is absolutely essential and we want to respect them and love them and get everything we can out of that out of that family dynamic that we can. Um, but when you're in my office or when you're on call with me, um, you know best about your life. And I'm going to help you, you know, the best I can figure out what you want and what you want within reason. Because maybe you don't have the same options as other people when you're young. Um, you know, based on your cultural experiences or your family, you might not have as much freedom. You might not be able to go do whatever you want whenever you want, you know, all of those things. But we'll work, we will work with you to figure out what power do you have, what choices can you make, um, and who are the healthiest adults in your life that you can draw from. Because that can be a great thing, right? Like if I have an elder who is really healthy, sane, caring about me, that might be my best resource as a young person. So maybe we can help them tap into that resource in a way that feels good for them. Um, and then if there are people, elders in their lives that are the opposite of that and really 
maybe pushing them in an unhealthy direction? How do we help them figure out who is the, the healthy people and who, who isn't? You know, how do we teach them, you know, who do you want to draw from? Who do you ask advice from, <laughs> you know, in your family? Sounds like this person has a lot of great advice. Sounds like this person doesn't have the best advice for you. You know, can you avoid the one that doesn't have the best advice or just not really pay much attention to that advice and go to someone else? But, um, yes, of course, cultural differences play into especially stuff with youth. I mean, stuff with everybody, right? But because young people don't have power over where they are and who they live with and all of that, it can play in especially and can be really hard, especially when it comes to gender identity, um, sexual orientation, sexual assault. You know, all of that stuff is really hard in the family of origin. And when there's cultural beliefs attached to that stuff, it's, it's very challenging. So. As an advocate for me, I really try not to ever badmouth somebody's family or their, you know, what their family system looks like. I just try to say, you know, that sounds really hard. You know, what do you, what do you love about your family and what doesn't work for you about your family and how can we help you kind of bridge the gap between those two things? But it's challenging. And that comes at the end when we talk about resources and referrals. I think sometimes um, working with families to try and get a third party, a neutral party is really great. Oh, okay. So, okay, getting back to volunteer screening. Um, developing screening for your staff and volunteers can be really hard. Um, often organizations, like I said, are really desperate to acquire volunteers. Um, so we don't screen maybe as thoroughly as we should. We might just do a background check, find out their information, you know, their age, where do they live, how often are they available. Um, and then, you know, we know all of our volunteers have to go through a 30-hour training if you're in Washington. Um, they have to go through a sexual assault training either with WICSOP or with your agency. So we kind of rely maybe too heavily on that <laughs> sometimes to be like, you'll get the training you need. Um, and not all of us, of course, but sometimes that can happen because we're overwhelmed and, again, we need the volunteers. Um, so this can be harmful to any group that experiences stereotypes, like somebody could come in and be really great with working with a survivor, and then something that uh, triggers them comes up. You know, somebody who, for example, is gay or is 16 or is trans or something, and we haven't specifically screened for that. We haven't thought about, you know, what would you do if this happened? You know, what would you do in this scenario? Um, how do you deal with these things as they come up? And then that person's stumped, and they're all of a sudden kind of like, uh, I don't know if I can help you with this. You know, and I know I was working with a specific LGBTQ youth organization when I was doing direct service, um, but we got referrals from hotline, from the 24-hour hotline, sexual assault hotline all the time because we knew queer youth better, which was great. Um, but sometimes we got referrals just because that person was queer, not because that not because the sexual assault hotline wasn't the right place for them to call. Does that make sense? So people could refer out just because they were afraid to hear the story. Does that make sense? So we got a lot of people calling saying, well, they referred me to you, and we were like, but why? You know, why? I understand we are specific to LGBTQ youth, but it sounds like what you were calling about, the sexual assault hotline should have been a great resource for you. Um, so being careful with that, that it's not just like, I'm going to pass this person off as soon as possible because they're not my, my key population. I don't work with youth very much, so I'm going to find a different youth-serving organization that, that can, and I'm going to immediately refer. I want to be partners with that youth organization, and I want to make sure that I'm giving them the best um, experience possible, but I don't want to pass them off or not get more training or not know how to handle them um, and just rely heavily on other people in the community who do. Okay. So how do we scream for ageism? I think, so this, this uh, slide, it's a combination of any of these things, and it can look really different for each agency. So I didn't give you really, really specific examples, but between volunteer applications, trainings, and the follow-up and accountability, or shadowing, or check-ins, or whatever you want to call it, there has to be a heavy, <laughs> a heavy combination of these three things. So if your application doesn't get a lot of information and doesn't ask for someone to talk about a scenario or doesn't um, really push and gauge comfort levels um, with volunteers and youth, then your training should. And you should have a lot of in-person on, you know, hands-on trainings with your volunteers. 
if you don't have a lot of in-person hands-on trainings with your volunteers, then your volunteer application should be really long. <laughs> you know? Like, so this is kind of my suggestion is there should be a combination. So either I'm going to start with, like, the most annoying, super long volunteer application ever for my volunteers, um, and what that's going to do is weed out people who don't want to do that very long application, um, or it's going to give me a lot of information. So I can include scenarios um, in there that are, you know, about youth, that are about um, LGBT folks, that are about Native Americans, that are about, you know, whatever it is that it's like, we need to get a kind of a feel for what would you do if this happened. You know, if this person called, if, um, you know, X, Y, and Z. And they don't know necessarily when they're applying. They don't know all the rules, right? So they don't know that it's like, I would have to make a mandated report. Or they might not have that information, but we're going to get a feel for what their instincts are, and that's what matters more to me. You can teach people the rules. You can't teach people new instincts a lot of the time. So if the instinct is, you know, to give them money for food and give them a ride to their family's house or to give them my personal number, then that instinct scares me a little bit. I can still teach them not to do that, but I think that's the stuff where, like, I can start to get a feel for your boundaries. I can start to get a feel for, for what your motives are if I give them enough scenarios. I hope that makes sense. My preference is that my volunteer applications are a little bit shorter and that I do more in-person trainings. And this is aside from the 30-hour training. So if you are living in Washington and you have your required sexual assault training, um, that's great. And there's tons of really good information in there. I want to have a follow-up in-person training just about scenarios with the people that I serve. Um, you can use the same scenario and give different age ranges because I know that you're not all dealing with just youth or you're not primarily dealing with youth. So if you have one example of a sexual assault experience, um, then you can use that and say, okay, what if that person's 25? What if that person's 16? What do you do if that person's 85? Um, and just get a feel for, like, wh what are the differences in training? Um, what's the difference when you talk to them? How do you approach that, that specific experience? Um, and just see what people's instincts are. My preference is to do that in a group of people, a small group of volunteers. Um, I think that that's the best way. I did that with um, Oasis when I was working at Oasis as a volunteer coordinator. Uh, we did, we had an application process. We interviewed each volunteer, which I find super helpful because you can kind of immediately know if you want to know more about them from that interview or if you want to see where they can go with it. Um, you are the sexual assault advocates. So your instincts are pretty good. You, you get a feel for people, you know, and you, you'll know if people's motives are kind of weird, you know. <laughs> I'm not going to lie to you. If you have a youth-specific program or you're implementing a youth-specific program, some people's motives are weird. It doesn't mean that they're creepy or they're trying to, you know, assault or have power over youth, but it could be that they are really idealizing you. It could be that they're really painting youth in this, light that is completely unrealistic, and it could be that they want to save them. It could be that they want to connect them to a church. It could be that they want to, you know, S, Y, and Z. You know, it could be that they had their own sexual assault experience as a young person, which is not a problem, except if they haven't dealt with it and they want to deal with it with those young people, um, which I've seen happen also, you know, where someone's really working out their own stuff. Uh, with the group that they're serving. So when people are specifically wanting to work with youth, I think it's extra important to make sure you know why and you know, you know what happens if this happens. And do they feel comfortable with a lot of shadowing? Because a lot of skills we can teach people, and I don't want you to throw away good volunteers because they don't say the right things um, all at the right time, but I do want us to, to notice, you know, do they have good boundaries? Can they follow the policies and the rules really well? Um, do they do they want to do that even more than they want to follow their own agenda? You know, that they want to follow your policies more than they want to have the experience they think they're supposed to have with young people. Um, I think that that's really essential. So, again, in-person trainings, um, notice responses that can be problematic, and um, provide a lot of shadowing so that they can see what you do on the hotline. They can see how you react to an in-person experience. Um, and then do a lot of follow-up and accountability with volunteers. 
I tried to do quarterly trainings with them, and it wasn't always easy based on our schedule and all the crisis that was happening and all of that, but I really tried to do one training every two to three months for all the ongoing volunteers and check in about things that are challenging. Okay. So staff. Um, all of this applies for staff as well, obviously, um, but staff have more training opportunities, and you are all going to set the tone for your volunteers. So you, if, if my staff, <laughs> if my staff uh, can't stand young people, that's a problem, right? <laughs> and I think a lot of people are really truly afraid of young people. So I don't say that I say that humor, humor with humor, I should say, but um, not. It's not a joke. Like, some people are truly, truly terrified of them, and they might feel really good about working with survivors, but that doesn't mean you feel really good about working with youth. Um, so I think that that is an important thing to set the tone with. And if, you're, if your staff is afraid of, of young people or has a lot of issues working with young people, that is the area that I would definitely target um, with extra training, um, ongoing support, checking in, you know, all of those things. So if you or your staff are not comfortable, um, that's the time to have open discussions. And we, we want you to get support from your leadership and your peers. And I don't know about you, but it depends on the organization and how it's all set up and the dynamics, whether your leadership are going to feel more comfortable than you. Um, okay. So with staff, I just want to emphasize one more thing, that I really believe that screening Screening for isms and self-reflection makes for the best staff. So if I'm interviewing or if I'm thinking of hiring, I really hope that that's my main priority and um, not necessarily just that they want to help survivors. People can be taught how to help in the most effective ways, but it's really hard to teach people the lack of um, isms. You know what I mean? Like it's hard to teach someone to let go of their prejudices from their childhood. It's hard to teach people to deal with their stuff from when they were 17. It's impossible for me as a boss or a supervisor or a peer to say, you really need to deal with your stuff. Um, I don't even think it's legal, you know? So it's, it's something that when I'm screening for staff and, and volunteers, that's the thing that I find the most valuable is that they have that ability to self-reflect, that they're able to say, yeah, I'm not perfect. You know, sometimes this, this really is a struggle for me. Um, some scenarios sound really scary to me, and I want extra help with those. Um, that is what's going to make me feel more confident, uh, that someone's challenged their own racism, that someone's challenged their own ageism, that someone's challenged their own transphobia, xenophobia, you know, all of those things. I, I want to see that in um, the scenarios that I give them in an interview. I want to see that in the scenarios that I give them on an application. Um, I, those are the things that I feel like really can create quality staff and quality volunteers. Um, so I just, I can't emphasize that enough, that just like with volunteers, I want my staff to feel comfortable, not just with my target population, but with everybody that's coming in the office. And if you're not feeling comfortable, why is that? What can we do about it? How can we support you to get more comfortable? Um, but that should not be a side note. It shouldn't be the thing that, you know, at the end of the interview, you go, oh, by the way, <laughs> you know, um, do you have any problem with uh, immigrants? You know, like, and, and they say, no, no, no. And you go, oh, okay, great. Um, that's not how it would work for me. You know, I want that to be kind of first and foremost. And, and I want young people to be involved in all of these conversations because, like I said, 80% of people who experience sexual assault in the state of Washington experience it before they're 18 years old. So if they're not coming into your agency, if they're not calling your hotline, um, there's a bigger problem, you know. Um, and I know that a lot of young people are not wanting to disclose. They are not wanting to get reports made on them. They don't want, you know, any of those things. So they might be avoiding that process altogether. Um, but plenty of, plenty of young people are in the system already. Plenty of young people are experiencing um, court or experiencing hospitals are experiencing all of that, all, all that have intersections with you and your agency. Um, so it's important that they're not a side note when we're thinking of volunteers and staff um, in just general mainstream um, sexual assault organizations. Youth are 
mainstream. You know, they're marginalized and they're told that their decisions don't mean anything and that they don't have power, but there's many of them. <laughs> you know, they're a large population and they're experiencing sexual assault on a daily basis. Okay. That's my little tangent on that. Um, so intakes uh, are, I talked about them a little bit earlier, and I want to just go a little bit more in depth into them. So intakes is really how your agency screens survivors and sets the tone. A way to make intakes youth-friendly, and really I say people-friendly because if it's friendly for youth, it's usually friendly for people <laughs> also, um, <laughs> is to um, think about these things. So I was thinking about this earlier today. I say, like, how much information is necessary. I'm sure you guys have seen this meme online that says, is it true? Is it necessary? Is it helpful? And that's about, like, how much, what do I have to say in the world and what am I contributing to the world? You know, when I speak, is it true? When I speak, is it necessary? Um, when I speak, is it helpful? Um, I think that's true with all the questions we ask our survivors, too, uh, the survivors that come into our agencies. So I want to think about, um, you know, is this a necessary piece of information for me to get? Is it definitely going to be something that is helpful for my agency or for the young person? or for the survivor in general, um, and can it be proven to be true or not? You know, I'm not asking opinion pieces on, on these intakes. So if I don't need someone's last name, I don't ask for it. That's, that's how our intakes work um, at Oasis, and I, I have a lot of respect for that organization and how they um, thought about youth-centered policies and survivor-centered policies. So I use them a lot as an example. Um, but we didn't ask for their address, and we didn't ask for their last name, and, you know, we didn't ask for a lot of digging questions on those intakes. We asked just get very general information. Um, we also asked questions that had nothing to do with trauma. You know, we asked about uh, their their moods. We asked about if they have supportive, supportive people in their lives um, that they can think of and name. You know, we asked about their food preferences. We asked about a lot of things because this is where I can get to know you um, as you're coming into my agency. Um, and the way that we acquired this information, when I say how do, we, how do you acquire the information, was not by giving a form, letting them sit down and fill it out and bring it back to a desk when they were done. Um, and this is what, I, I think this is a key piece of information for keeping it youth friendly, but again, I think survival friendly is, is also true, that I read the policies out loud to them. We talked about them. We gave examples of each one. We didn't just say, you know, here's a policy, do you agree or disagree? Um, we talked about, you know, when we say no intimate touching while you're at our center, <laughs> what we mean is, you know, <laughs> we give examples. That means um, sometimes that means holding hands even depending on how that feels and what's going on with you and who you're, you know, all of these things. Sometimes that means X, Y, and Z. That definitely means making out while you're at drop-in, you know. It, it's all these things. And so then they go, oh, okay. You know, I understand what you're saying. Do, I, do you agree to these policies? Awesome. You know, they're getting a real feel for, like, what we're about, what we tolerate and don't tolerate, um, what's going on with us. And the more information you give them, the more choices they feel like they have. So, again, you know, this is just part of the empowerment model that I'm telling you up front all the information that you need. Um, and then, you know, in that intake process, I can really explain to them what my obligations are. Um, so that means, you know, if I hear X, Y, and Z, I'm going to have to make a report. That means I might have to call CPS. It means I might have to call the cops. It means I might have to do, you know, X, Y, and Z. Um, if you tell me that you're suicidal and actively thinking about killing yourself or have a plan, um, I may have to, and this isn't always a rule, but depending on how much information I get and how serious the, um, the suicidal thoughts are, it's possible that I'll have to make a report about that. So I want to tell young people all of this up front and then say, I'm also really happy to help you with these things if they come up for you. If you want to tell me this information so that I can make a report, I want to make that report with you or for you. Um, if you want to tell me that you're struggling with suicide and suicidal thoughts and you want me to help you get some help for that, I want you to tell me that information. I'm not afraid of you telling me that information. I'm happy to take that information, but I want you to know that I have to do something with the information you give me. Um, I think it's really important that we practice this step um, out loud with each other as staff and volunteers. How do you say what your obligations are? What are your policies in your agency? 
if your um, staff and your volunteers don't know your policies um, backwards and forwards, and Sandy, I think this is something she works on a lot <laughs> in the field, you know, is like having really consistent policies, learning them, um, making them palatable. They don't have to be in jargon that you don't understand or that your staff doesn't understand. They can be really straightforward policies. You know, if this happens, then this happens. You know, it's very simple and it's very, it's very clear and we want it to be so clear that you could tell a 14-year-old and they would understand. And that's, that's where I'm coming from. And I think, again, this isn't just youth-centered, it's survivor-centered. Um, I often don't understand anything more than a 13 or 14-year-old does right now, you know? So I want, if I'm coming into your agency and I have trauma experiences, I want to understand what I'm supposed to do and what's going to happen. Um, it also means that, like, not just in the intake process, but if I'm sitting with a young person or if I'm on the phone with a young person, I'm going to want to interrupt them if they're in the middle of telling me something if I think they don't understand. If I have a feeling that, oh, you haven't done an intake in four months um, and you experienced a prior sexual assault and now you're telling me about a new sexual assault, not just the one that already happened, um, that I'm also going to have to make a report about that. So I want to pause and say, I just want to remind you, if I know, you know, this information that I'm going to have to make a report, and I'm, and I'm very happy to do that for you or with you if you would like me to, but I just want you to have that information and remember that information. So keeping it just really, really consistent, really clear, um, communicating really well, and again, not just handing papers over, having people sign them, and then taking them back and saying, oh, I have all the information, and I asked for their last name and their address, you know. Um, that's not necessary. I just want to get enough information that I can be helpful to them. Okay. So I talked about consistency a little bit, um, but, you know, just again, good communication, boundaries, um, consistency, that's what makes something youth-friendly. Uh, not sugarcoating things, not promising things are going to be okay, um, you know, not joining the crisis, not doing any of those things, those things are not going to help the young person feel empowered. Um, being consistent with my communication, being clear, being calm, um, having lots of boundaries, not being a friend, not being a mom, not being a pastor, not being any of those things, um, that is what's going to make me youth friendly as a person and as an agency if we, if we teach that across the board. Um, yeah, so we already talked about this. So having volunteers and staff and policies all in line with each other supports the empowerment of young people. And since young people just don't have the choices, like we said, they don't have the ability to make every choice in their lives, the more communication and honesty and consistency we can give them, the more empowered they feel. Then they know they can go to your agency and they know what they can expect. No matter who they get on the phone, no matter what staff member comes to the door, um, if they feel like they know if I do X, Y, and Z, then I'm going to get this result. You know, if I tell them, if I don't tell them any specifics about an, an assault, but I talk to them about how I need support because I'm feeling um, like I'm experiencing PTSD and flashbacks, if I tell them I might want to go to therapy, I know that they're going to help me find a therapist. I know that they're going to help me, um, you know, get through the night without nightmares or give me some activities I can do, or they're going to always answer the phone when I call, and they're never going to try and find out where I live or what my last name is. Um, then I feel really safe contacting you. And that's, that's what's super important in this. Okay, so referrals. This is uh, one of the last pieces I'm gonna talk about. When I asked what an advocate's role is, you all mentioned information and referrals, information and referrals, um, and that is super helpful. Um, Taking the time to find out what what is youth friendly in your in your community, what services are made specifically for youth, is very helpful. And that's true with not just youth, but you know what agencies or what programs are really good with queer youth, LGBT youth. What agencies and what um, organizations are really good with um, youth who are experiencing poverty, with youth who are living in tribes, with youth who are you know X, Y, and Z. You want to know the kind of what is out there. And again, I think when someone said not to be a Rolodex, you know, <laughs> um, not to just say, okay, I'm going to basically farm out your problems to other people. That's not what I'm doing. But I want to partner with as many of these agencies as possible. Um, 
I talked about resilience, and I want to just say a little bit more about that. I have this um, this thing from the International Resilience Project. So something that really supports and kind of transforms a young person's experience is these three things. I have, so if I'm the young person, I can say I have core resources and external supports. Um, so that means there's people around me that I trust or who love me no matter what. Um, I am a child's internal strengths, attitudes, and beliefs. So I am respectful of myself and others. I am sure things will turn out right and okay. Um, and I can, a child's social and interpersonal skills. I can talk to others about things that frighten or bother me. I can find ways to resolve problems that I face. Um, I, I talked about those in this slide a little bit lower down where I say I have supportive adults. Um, they are positive and create opportunities to build skills. Um, and I have support and healthy social skills. This is what creates the difference between a youth who survives throughout their adulthood and thrives throughout their adulthood. So if I can um, work with other agencies and other referrals to create more of that supportive environment, to create more adults that love them and support them no matter what, um, and that might not be your agency. You know, we're often sexual assault agencies are, are just there for the time of crisis. They're there for those kind of like worst moments or going through court or, you know, X, Y, and Z, whatever those things look like. And so we want to hook them up with other adults that can be those people. Often the people in their household are not the ones for them. It's not always their parents. It's not always their teachers. Um, but the schools can be resources as well. And, and we want to know what those are so we can hook them up. You know, we want to say, okay, I'm working with you right now. I'm here for you through this. Um, what other services are you interested in? Do you need an after-school program? Do you need um, a therapist, a good therapist? Do you need a good tutor? Do you need, you know, X, whatever that is. And if we are armed with that information as um, sexual assault agencies, then that is doing a huge service for that young person. If I'm, uh, when I talked about that junior high job, it was interesting because, you know, they, they went to class an hour at a time with their teachers. So they had like five classes a day. They saw each teacher for an hour a day. And then at 2.30 when the bell rang, they came to our program. And there was like 10 adults working in this program. And we were open until 6.30 or 7. I forget the time. So we were with that person four or five hours a day. Then they would sometimes take a bus for two hours to get home. Um, and then they would see their parent for maybe an hour before they had to go to bed, right? So they'd get home around 7.30, um, Soon they were going to bed. And then they're getting up at 6.30 in the morning so they can get to school on time to spend an hour at a time with each teacher. So <laughs> this is when we thought about, you know, we really are the most, we have the most face time with these young people. And something that I've noticed when I work with young people is the longer you just hang out quietly, the more they tell you things, the more they know that they can trust you. Um, the less investigating I do and the more I just hang out and say, oh, cool, that sounds nice. You know, <laughs> how's that working for you? What do you want to do next? You know, whatever those things are, then they start to say, uh, maybe I should tell you something else about me, you know. And that used to happen all the time, and I was so surprised. I would just be, you know, telling the truth about my values and my experiences um, and talking them about their homework. And then all of a sudden they'd say, do you think it's sick to be gay? And I'd say, no, I don't. I don't think that. But it took 10 hours of hanging out, doing nothing, for that young person to say, I'm going to ask you a hard question because I trust you. I believe you that you're going to tell me the truth. And I've already, I'd already spouted all my values by then because that's what we were doing in that program, so they knew it was safe. Um, but, you know, they don't start a lot of the time with the hard questions. Young people will wait and they'll test you. They want to see what your reaction is, so some shocking information a lot of the time first. They want to know that you're consistent with your policies. They want to see that, that they can trust you completely before they tell you anything hard about themselves or before they believe you that maybe it's best to make a report. Maybe it's best for you to get out of your house if this is what's happening to you. Um, but they need to know that you're different than the other adults that they're experiencing in their, in their lives. So information and referral sometimes is the best way to do that. If your agency is not set up to spend extended periods of time with young people, or to spend extended periods of time, you know, talking to one individual, then we want to know what agencies or what organizations are set up to do that and how do we hook those youth up with that agency. And it's part of our job as advocates to, someone said, um, you know, walk with them, um, not just, 
not just sending them away, you know, walking them to another, through their experience as a survivor, it's totally appropriate to take them to those other agencies. It's totally appropriate to meet those adults with them if they want you to. You know, to say, okay, great, I'm going to meet you at the Y. I'll meet you at the Y at 4 p.m. Um, I will, I will, you know, learn about that agency with you. We will meet those people. Um, that might be a huge service to them, and it's totally within your role as an advocate to be able to do that. You know, we used to teach you how to take, take the bus. We would go, okay, I guess we'll just all get on the bus. And we'll <laughs> learn that together because that's a huge resource for you to get from one place to the other um, on your own you know, autonomously, um, how do you get a bus pass? Let's help you figure that out. You know, all of those things, they're skill building and they're things that as advocates we're, we're totally able to do. And in the empowerment model, I always think about like, I am not going to work harder on your life than you do. But as hard as you work on your life, I will match you. You know, that as an advocate, you come into my agency or as, as a person really, and you're willing to do anything to get to a better place, I'm willing to do anything alongside you, like somebody said. So, you know, if you're like, I will learn how to take the bus, I'm super scared and I'll do it, you know, I'll do all these steps, X, Y, and Z, then I'll say, great, I'll do all those steps with you. I can walk with you through that. Um, you want to go to the Y and you, or you want to go to a therapist and you're scared and you want me to show up at your therapist's office and meet that therapist with you? Sure, I can do that. Um, but it's not my job to force you into that situation. It's not my job to hold your hand and make you go. It's not my job to track you down when you don't show up and beg you to show up. Um, none of those things are effective. But as much as you're willing to do the work, I'm willing to do the work with you um, to create these things. Young people, like I said, with the resilience, like this having supportive adults, um, having positive opportunities to build skills, um, and having so healthy social skills, if you can help create that environment for them or, or walk them through that experience, truly, no matter how bad the situation is, it can turn out good. You know, that those young people are totally likely to completely recover, thrive, um, experience new lives and great lives. So I just want to plug that because I think that as someone who worked with youth for a long time, sometimes it looks very dire and it looks like that person's um, just never going to catch a break and it's never going to be okay. Uh, and they're never going to feel better. They're never going to get a different experience because it's it's big stuff and it's scary stuff, and sometimes it's life or death stuff. Um, so so just remembering that that they have the ability to recover and and be resilient is really important for our own self care. I think as people who work with young people. Okay. So my last little slide here is who is awesome? You're awesome. Um, <laughs> you guys are awesome. You're the people that um, that are on the lines and, and being there for all the survivors that are coming into your office. And I appreciate you wanting to know more about how to serve young people and getting more in depth um, with what that can look like. I am a very anecdotal trainer, so if you want some more um, factual information about staff and things like that, I didn't pull them out of nowhere. I can tell you um, where they came from or send those to you. I can tell Sandy where they came from and she can send those to you. Um, so I, I really appreciate you being on the call. We have about 15 minutes left for questions um, or comments. If anyone wants to send those my way, now would be the time. So thank you again, Erin. That was a great webinar and a lot of really useful information for our program. Um, as a reminder, I do want to um, remind everyone to please take just a few minutes and do the evaluations um, that will come out at the end of the call. Um, and a recording of today's webinar materials will be posted on our website under trainings um, and then recorded webinars. So we are going to leave the, the chat box open and the phone lines um, um, open so that if you have questions, if you um, have comments that you'd like to share back with Aaron. Um, We'll probably leave the, the lines open until about 2.55. Um, and then again, I will uh, remind you at the end to um, email me any additional participants that um, if you're sharing a computer with one of your colleagues um, so that we can be sure and get an accurate count of attendance and I can be sure to get you um, your training hours. So um, we will start taking questions and Erin and will um, interact with you through uh, throughout the next few minutes. Okay, so I, there's one question that says, are there any state resources available for youth? 
Um, I think that depends on what you mean. Um, can you, if the person who asked that question, can you be more specific, like resources for survivors or um, like what are you looking for exactly? Okay, DV education was one thing that came to mind. I don't know if there's, um, I have not heard of anything that's specifically state resources that are consistent across the state. Um, each county has different programs for that and each like DV organization um, might have youth programs, it depends. Um, obviously in rural, rural areas, I think that's less and less true that there's specific DV education for young people. Um, so I guess the short answer is not that I know of. I do not know of, of any state resources that are consistent um, for young people. But that, I, what I would do is reach out to the why um, in, your, in your town or your county if you have one, because they have a lot of DV education um, resources and they might just have curriculums or they might have someone who actually does that sort of thing. Sorry, I hope that's helpful. I know there's not, not the best. Um, what would you suggest on getting our foot in the door of the public schools or how to approach DV? Yeah, so I didn't talk a ton about schools because they're so specific to each town and each county. Um, where I worked, I was in a more urban setting. I was in Tacoma. Um, so we had, we had pretty good relationships with the schools and they let us in and they let the sexual assault agency, the other sexual assault agency in town in um, to talk about, you know, some education and how to talk about healthy relationships and domestic violence and things like that. Uh, but that really depends on where you are. So I guess my suggestion on how to get your foot in the door of public schools is just to start calling every single one of them. There's really not an easier way. You can also show up there, <laughs> which we've done um, plenty of time, uh, and talk to teachers, talk to the principal, talk to school counselors. Those are usually the best um, folks. If they, if they have a after school program that are for like the Gay Straight Alliance or a, a girls club or things like that, sometimes those teachers are a little more progressive and so they're trying to find different ways to talk about those things. They might be a good in. Um, there's not really a, a more streamlined way other than to just reach out to the schools, call them and show up. I don't know if you've had experience with that and had and been rejected or not. So let me know if that's the case, but that's the only way I know to start. Um, so I have another question that says, my agency is just kicking off our youth program, so this will be new for us as well as the youth in the community. What are some good ways to reach out and provide services? What are some fun ways to work with youth in the community? That's like a whole nother webinar, but <laughs> I will say um, ways to reach out are to create some fun graphic flyers is always my suggestion and to actually go to places where youth are. If you want to promote youth uh, programming, you wanna get into schools if you can, um, or any after school programs where young people frequent. Um, holding community forums are really helpful. Like we, we used to hold open houses a lot where we'd say, our agency is an open house, everyone's welcome. And we would reach out and specifically invite principals, teachers, um, you know, every, everyone that young people come into contact throughout the day, and then we would talk about our services, what it looks like, pass out flyers, do that sort of thing, so that the outreach was there, um, just to get more youth in the door. Um, so we'd have to hear more about what your community youth program is to give you more specific suggestions. Um, but I suggest, if you're in Washington anyway, talking to the staff here at WICSAP, um, <laughs> and finding out great ways to do, like when I say here fun work with youth in the community, I always think of prevention because I think prevention is really fun. And Kat Minuski who works here is a good resource for that. She does a lot of work with um, organizations that work with teens and youth and uh, she has good resources and curriculums for like fun interactive programs for young people. Is that true, Sandy? Yes, and our SAM campaign um, in April also is focused at um, middle middle school age this year. Cool. So there's going to be a lot of um, 
information and games and different things that they're going to be mailing out. So um, definitely contact WixApp and see if you haven't already been contacted about receiving SAM materials. You could uh, put in a request and that might be a really good way to engage with your youth. Um, and it's, it's in a structured, more of a structured way so the schools are familiar with the SAM campaigns and whatnot. So um, definitely contact a WixApp member and see about getting um, those materials for April. Yeah, and, and Sandy um, just mentioned the one coming up. Their last two were also developed specifically for youth, the SAM campaigns. Did you say that? No. Okay. But, but that's true. <laughs> so we have one for older teens uh, that's like a game uh, and a game for young children that has to do with building resilience. Both are focused on building resilience, so it's not about preventing sexual assault necessarily from happening. Um, from the, to them, like they're not trying to prevent their own sexual assaults from happening to them, but they are building like healthy relationship skills, um, how to talk about who healthy adults are in your life, how to, you know, feel your feelings when you're overwhelmed, you know, things like that. So skill building games and there are guides for those and questions for those. So that's something that Wikidap might have access to as well, at least the PDF versions they could send you, if not the hard copies. So you could contact them for that. There's also the In Their Shoes game that mm -hmm. a lot of the schools um, are familiar with, and they've got a domestic violence and a sexual assault version of those. So that might um, also be a really good resource to look into um, if you're just starting to get into the schools um, and offering the youth services because it's, it's interactive um, and it, it gives them the opportunity to make choices um, as it relates to their own life. So it's, it's um, a resource that, that is available also. Yeah. Um, and somebody responded to the question earlier about how to get into school, so I wanted to share that information. Um, they suggest that if you're trying to get your foot in the door at school to contact the school boards or districts and ask to present at a meeting um, as a good way to just get your foot in the door and to get some contacts, that's a good idea. Or to join other committees with teachers, schools, board members, et cetera. Yeah, that's a really good idea, just to get kind of your foot in the door with other people already doing kind of meeting and talking about young people, if you get in there and start saying, this is important for young people too, enough people will listen to you. <laughs> That's been my experience also. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, any other questions? All right, it is um, 2.55, so we're getting off here a few minutes early, but I am super grateful for the opportunity. I really, I love Wixap. Um, I, I just can't say enough about all the resources they have for you. And this webinar will be recorded um, and the slides will be sent out. So if you need it and you want it, pass it along to people. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you all. And again, um, if you want to email sandy at wixup.org uh, for any additional participants, I will make sure that they get their training certificates. Um, and please take just a few minutes to do the evaluations. Thank you.